For most of the games that I consider entrance into the 1990 RPG showdown, it's because they're part of an already established franchise. Fire Emblem, on the other hand, is the beginning of the franchise. For a game series that's become one of Nintendo's cornerstones, you might think that it was a big hit right out of the gate. And it really wasn't. Fire Emblem wasn't unpopular, but it had trouble gaining any traction even in Japan until the 2000s. It was the Game Boy Advance games that really kicked the series into high gear there. And of course in the US, Fire Emblem was just the game that all the Swords guys in Smash Brothers came from, until the 3DS games started up. Strangely enough, this is the game that I own the most versions of. I have several games that I own three different versions of, but for Fire Emblem, I own four. The original Famicom, of course, the remake on the Super Famicom, which is really my preferred version, the remake on the Nintendo DS, which was the first Fire Emblem game I played, and then the recent translation of this original game that was released on the Switch. It's strange that this is a game that Nintendo has gone back to so many times. Speaking of which, this is Nintendo's first game on the Famicom since Mother. That was almost a year before Fire Emblem. Nintendo is still operating in that phase where they're putting their development efforts toward the Game Boy and now the Super Famicom. So these releases from them are pretty rare. The RPG Showdown actually caused problems for the release of Fire Emblem. Manufacturing cartridges for Dragon Quest IV and Final Fantasy III took up most of Nintendo's manufacturing capacity, and so Fire Emblem's release was delayed three months. Unfortunately for Fire Emblem, Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy were also delayed. The full title of this one is Fire Emblem Ankokuryo to Hikari no Tsurugi, or Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light to use the subtitle given in English. The commercial for Fire Emblem is one of those that's extremely well remembered in Japan. It featured a chorus singing the main theme. It's made that theme one of the most persistent pieces of music out of Nintendo. I'm skipping ahead to the punchline here, but Fire Emblem is low-key one of the big winners of the 1990 RPG showdown. They might not have had the sales, but Fire Emblem was the game that crystallized what strategy RPGs would be, and it inspired an entire generation of game developers. The story of Fire Emblem is of a continent at war. A century after his defeat, the Dragon Emperor has revived and conquered most of the land. That includes the home of Prince Marth, who fled to a neighboring country with his sister. But now his sister's been abducted by a pirate raid, and so Marth gathers some allies to go out and stop them. From there, the story plays out across 25 scenarios. The goal on most of these is to have Marth take an objective on the map. And usually, that means you're going to have to wipe out everybody. Enemies are just too aggressive and do too much damage for you to ignore them. And inevitably, the objective has a more powerful enemy sitting on it. On your turn, you can just move all of your characters around, and if you move them adjacent to an enemy, then they can attack. You select one of your troops by hitting the A button, and then you can hit the A button again to see their stats, and then if you hit A again, it'll end their movement without you doing anything. A nice thing about Fire Emblem is right until you close that final action menu, you can always hit the B button to back up. You're not locked into a move until you give the command to attack, fiddle with your inventory, or stop. If you choose to attack, then you watch a little scene play out. The results of the attacks are mostly determined by the character stats and the terrain. The original Fire Emblem doesn't have the triangle system that later games do, where there's a rock-paper-scissors-like system to determine which weapon beats what. That doesn't mean all weaknesses are gone, though. Flying units still take extreme damage from bows. Regardless of the outcome of the battle, survivors get a bit of experience, and if you win the battle, then you get a lot of experience. Well, relatively a lot. At level 1, it'll still take about 4 or 5 battles to level up. When you level up, every one of your stats has a certain chance to increase. Whether it goes up or not is totally dependent upon luck. That said, there are a few trap characters. Some of your strongest early units have a 0% chance of increasing most of their stats. There isn't a lot of experience to go around in this game, and a level for one of them means that a character who will grow into being something better isn't getting a level. 
The best thing you can do with those trap characters is take advantage of the mechanic that Fire Emblem is best known for, permadeath. You carry your roster of heroes with you through the scenarios, but if one of them falls in battle, they're gone forever. Well, kind of. There is a rare item in this game that can revive a fallen ally. You're not solely limited to the characters you start with, though. In some scenarios, you'll pick up additional friends, and sometimes you can convert enemies to be your allies. Doing that usually requires bringing over somebody that they know to talk to them rather than fight. Besides just attacking enemy units, there's a few other things you can do on the map. You can visit villages to get assistance, or go shopping for additional weapons. Everyone's weapons only have a certain number of uses, and as the game progresses you'll be able to buy them better equipment. And then there are the fortresses where you can retreat a wounded unit to, and they'll recover a little bit of health every turn. Be careful about relying on those, though. Every scenario technically has a time limit of 255 turns. Go over that and you lose. The other losing condition is if Marth dies. Though as you might guess, if you lose a ton of troops, you could put your game into a state where you really can't continue onward. Given the constraints of my recording schedule, I didn't do a lot of progress here, only playing to the second map, so I can't really show off things like all of the alternate endings, or the piles of different characters and small dramas that play out among them. Just because Fire Emblem wasn't a smash hit right out of the gate doesn't mean that this first game didn't have any other tie-ins. Thanks to there being several reissues of it, there are multiple novel adaptations and comic adaptations of the story, audio dramas, plural. The growth of Fire Emblem as a series made a lot of people revisit this game. While there's an absolutely enormous number of Fire Emblem sequels, we're only going to get one more on the Famicom. Obviously, this is a beloved game in Japan. As for myself, well, it's a new style of role-playing game, or maybe strategy game. And so Fire Emblem really stands out among the games of 1990. But that said, it's a game with a lot of rough edges. The combat system is just brutal, and you're going to have to retry scenarios over and over again. And it doesn't help that this game has been done better in its own remakes. So that's the version I recommend playing of this. But without that knowledge of the future, Fire Emblem is a really impressive game. It might have gotten drowned out on the initial release by all of the other RPGs being released at the same time, but you can see why it became a favorite of game developers. While there had been games that combined strategy and role-playing elements before it, before this, the two had never been brought together as successfully as Fire Emblem did. Even if the series took a while to get going, this is one of the cornerstones of Japanese RPGs.